Hello everybody, I'm Nick and in this video I'm going to show you why, even though promising, it is highly unlikely that EF Core 8 will be good enough for you to replace Dapper for your SQL queries. There's some great work being done by the EF Core team, however, I'm going to drill into exactly what's going on, what is being added, and why the performance just isn't there at all, at least for now. If you like that of content and you want to see more, make sure you subscribe, ring the notification bell, and for more training, check out nickchapsters.com. All right, so let me show you what I have here. And I want to make something very clear. We are still in preview. The numbers are likely to change. However, I'm not too hopeful that they're going to come too close to what we're going to see from Dapper, at least in EF Core 8. I believe that we're going to see an optimization in 9 and eventually 10. All right, so let's look at the code. So what I have here is the same project I've actually been using for the past two EF Core videos, and I'm going to put links in the description down below because I do go in detail in those videos as well for other aspects of EF Core. But in here, we're going to be testing queries. The same thing that Dapper does, EF Core 8 is now able to do as well. So it is an even playing field. We're going to test the exact same functionality for both libraries. Now, I'm only briefly going to be explaining the setup and the methodology for this type of testing here, the benchmarks, because I already have two in-depth videos on those. So please check them in the description down below if you want to find out more or if something does not make sense, I do explain it there. But before we take a look at the setup, I want to show you what we are going to be testing. So consider the following. Dapper allows me to have a query like this, where I can say query single or default async and then pass an object and then what I'm going to get out of this back from that query will actually be mapped into my object. So if I go to SQLite, which is the database of choice for this benchmark, I have an ID, title and year of release as names of these columns. And then in the movie object, I have an ID, time and year of release. So we're going to have an object mapping happening from this SQL query all the way to movie. This is the whole value proposition of an ORM. Now, traditionally, if you want to do this with EF Core, you would be using sort of the DB set. So you have a movies DB set and then use that DB set to say single or default and pass down a delegate and anything that matches that delegate returns the value. However, what you couldn't do is run queries for unmapped types. So if I had something like this and I said at movies context and I go to the database, yes, we did get those two methods in .NET 7, the SQL query and the SQL query row that accept a generic type. But if I try to pass down the movie and then I do something like this, where I say SQL query, return a movie, and I say select everything from movies where ID matches that movie ID with a limit one and then single or default async, this will actually fail. This method in .NET 7 would only work for things like integers or strings. So if you have a scalar thing that you want to return, it will work. But if I go and I try to run this, then as you're going to see over here, we're going to get an exception. And that's because the element type of movie is used in SQL query method. It is not natively supported by your database provider, blah, blah, blah. So this was not possible in .NET 7, which is what I'm using right here. However, now in .NET 8, what I can do, and I'm going to go ahead and just update to .NET 8 Preview 4 for this project. I'm going to say properties over here in .NET 8 and also update all the EF correlated NuGet packages. So all of them moved to the latest preview, then what you're going to see, and again, this is not part of the movie context, the context does not really know of this movie's DB set existence. So what I can do here is just run this and just debug it to show you what's happening. And if I try to run this query now, where I say, here's a year of release, assume that this is a parameter, uh, use this SQL query for my movie object over here, pass it down as a parameter and say to list async, then this now will in fact work. And I do get the seven movies that do match that. Query. So this gives you the exact same experience as Dapper. Now, the very interesting thing about this approach, which I both like and I'm a bit skeptical about, is how they chose to deal with parameters. Because in Dapper, you have parameters like this. You have an add symbol, and then you have the name of the parameter, and then you create this anonymous object, or you pass down an object that has this property name, and then it's being matched, and you return the result back. But in this approach over here, what you have if I go to the API is actually something called a formatable string. So if we take a look at what's happening here by just quickly extracting this into a variable is actually very, very interesting. I'm going to just debug this again and go here and show you what's going on. Now, on first glance, you might say something like, oh, this is so prone to SQL injection because you have a string interpolated parameter here. I can't believe you're doing this. Anyone can inject their thing. 
Now, here's the thing. Formatable string works in a very interesting way. Even though it looks here that the string is actually just the query with that injected parameter through the interpolation, behind the scenes, what you're getting is actually a format. So it is taking that interpolated parameter and it moves it into an argument in effectively the same way that Dapper would do it conceptually. And then you have an argument array, which has this parameter in here, which will then be passed as a parameter and replaced. So you don't have to worry about SQL injection because it is very smart about how it's building that formatable string behind the scenes. The actual string is not what you're seeing here. The actual string is that templated format. And then that is passed down. It goes into the SQL query and that's what returns the values in the end. In any case, I'm going to merge that formatable string all the way in here again. And now with the project in .NET 8, what I'm going to do is actually run some benchmarks. Now, a bit of a quick introduction before I run the benchmark. What I'm doing here is I'm deterministically creating 100 items in this SQLite database. I'm using SQLite because the thing we're really testing here is the ability of the libraries itself to generate those queries and run them. The execution part does not matter. So if it was Postgres, SQLite, uh, SQL Server, it doesn't really matter at all. What we care about is the ability of the libraries themselves to take this and run it. So we have an even playing field in terms of what database is backing it up and we can isolate the actual overhead of using the library, which is what you're going to be seeing in those results. Now we're using async for everything and we're using a seed for the generation. So it's the same items being generated over and over again. I do go way more in depth into the details in those previous videos. I highly recommend you check those out after this video. But effectively, what we're testing is two queries. The first one is select a single movie by its ID over here with a limit of one, a singular default, and the same thing for Dapper, and then select all the movies that match a year of release. I'm passing down 1993, there's seven movies that match that. So these two methods will return seven, and these two methods will return one. I'm going to change this to release mode. The program.cs is ready. I'm going to run my benchmarks and see what I get back. All right, so results are back, and let's see what we have here. So as you can see, EF core query for one item, 45 microseconds and 10 kilobytes of memory. Dapper at seven microseconds and two kilobytes of memory. Huge difference. And then EF core query, it's actually even less than the single item and 11 kilobytes. And the same thing in Dapper, 12 microseconds and 3.8 kilobytes, which is very weird because given the fact that more items will be returned by the query, you would expect this to actually be slower than the get single item. Now the memory deviation makes sense, but the speed certainly does not. So I'm assuming they have to optimize things here even further. Now what I'm curious to know is whether strings themselves and my theory about strings here actually plays any role in the degradation. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to duplicate my EF core versions and I'm going to add a raw version because we have a SQL query raw here. Now ultimately what we're going to see here is the following. Remove string interpolation, change this to zero and pass down a, a new object array, which is what actually is going on behind the scenes, even for the non-row version, and then pass the parameter as an object in that array. That's what's going on behind the scenes. And I'm going to do the same for the other one. But how does that compare with a potential string issue? So I'm going to copy this, roll the changes back because we actually want the original version to have something to compare to, then paste this, say, row here and run this and see where we stand. All right, so results are back and let's see what we have here. So as you can see, there is actually not much of a change at all. There's a bit of less memory being allocated and slightly faster, but that is about it. And ultimately that's because this operation in formatable string is actually pretty optimized for what it is. And because eventually what you're going to call is that SQL query raw method anyway. So you're not really saving much. So what is the conclusion based on those results? Well, Keep an eye on this, but I would say that for now, I don't have enough details to confidently say to replace a third party library like Dapper if you're running queries like this, whether you're using it just for your read side of things or for unmapped types. But now I want to know from you, what do you think about all this? And are you using a mixture of both ORMs because you have unmapped types? Leave a comment down below and let me know. Well, that's all I had for you for this video. Thank you very much for watching. Special thanks to my Patreon for making videos possible. If you want to support me, so you're going to find the link in the description down below. Leave a like if you like this video, subscribe, more click the like, this and the bell as well. And I'll see you in the next video. Keep coding.